Hello and welcome to this episode of Smarter, a podcast by clinicians for clinicians, brought to you by Marta, an Australian leader in healthcare for more than a century. My name's Gillian Whiting. And I'm Bronwyn Jennings, gynaecology, oncology, clinical nurse consultant at Marta Hospital, Brisbane. And we're coming to you from Mianjin, the land on which this podcast is being recorded. Today we are joined by Dr Rowan Lowry, Senior Specialist Anatomical Pathologist at Marta Pathology. Rowan has worked at Marta Pathology for 18 years and is currently involved in gynaecological cancer research through Marta and Marta Research. Today he's sharing what it's like to work at Queensland's only live tissue biobank for gynaecological and breast cancers and how it's changing lives. Marta caring for the community for more than a century. Innovators in health, education and research. Home to world-class clinicians. State-of-the-art facilities. High quality, patient Australia's centric. largest and leading Turning maternity scientific provider. discoveries Educating into the nurses, leading healthcare advances. We are Marta. We are Marta. We are Marta. This is Smarta. Rowan, welcome to Smarta. Thanks, Gillian. An important place to start. Uh, what makes Marta's gynecological and breast cancer biobank so unique? So the first thing is there's a lot of volume of cancers here that are treated here. In, and we probably treat about 25% of the women's cancers in Queensland. So the first thing is we have access to a whole range of uh, patients who can donate tissue to the biobank. Secondly, it's the range of specimens that we have. Because the bank is here on campus, we can take fresh tissue and living tissue, blood samples, pathology samples, everything you can imagine that researchers want to use in their research to try and learn more about ovarian and breast cancer. So they are all used to make a difference to, for treatment? You bet. Now, that's a long way down the line getting to treatment. It's about learning about disease, about learning what treatments might work. But you're right, that's the ultimate goal. Rowan, you mentioned the collection of live tissue. What's the benefit of that as opposed to cryopreserved tissue? Sure. So we're talking about living tissue here, living cells. So the scenario is there'll be a patient in theatre. We'll take that tissue right from theatre down to my laboratory. We'll divide it up and we'll send it straight out to researchers. And we did that twice yesterday. It was an operating day. There were two patients who donated tissue. That tissue went to researchers straight away. So why do you want live tissue? It's because researchers can manipulate that tissue in the laboratory. And that's the best way to find out how cancers work, what's driving cancers, how do cancers respond to treatments. And that might be in a Petri dish, so this is growing um, cancer in a jelly so you can then make the cells multiply and manipulate them. Or it might even be putting that cancer into a mouse and then being able to treat the mouse with novel treatment agents to see how that cancer responds. So it's a really important way of finding out about cancers that's become very, very important and speeds up a lot of research as well. When you're talking about tissue, are you talking about tumour tissue only or are there other kinds of tissue? There's a whole range of different specimens that we use for biobanking and probably the most important is tumour tissue because that's, if you like, that's the key, that's the driver. So we certainly do take that tissue and we freeze it and we hand it on to researchers as live tissue to use in their laboratories. However, we're also collecting a whole range of other specimens and it might, might be blood samples, it might be what's called acidic fluid, that's the fluid that accumulates in the abdomen around tumours. And that's because whilst we're really interested in knowing what makes these cancers tick, we're also really interested in how does the body respond to cancer. So we've, we work with a lot of researchers who do work on, say, how the immune system responds to cancer. So they're interested in the immune systems that are in, uh, immune cells that are in the blood. Other researchers are really interested in trying to find better tests to find cancer early. What proteins can you find in the blood of women when we know they've got cancer? So there's a whole range of specimens that are potentially useful to different researchers. Rowan, what do clinicians need to know when we're looking to identify potential donors for the bank? So really, we would cast the net really broad. That's the first thing. Because even patients who don't have cancer, the specimens they can donate to the biobank are really, really useful. So that might be someone who comes in and we don't know whether they have cancer or not. They have an operation and good news, it's not cancer. But the blood that they've donated is actually really useful because normal blood is also really useful for researchers as well to compare against the blood of women who might have cancer. So 
any patient is a really useful potential candidate. In particular, though, patients who we think may have cancer are particularly important to identify as early as possible. That communication with the patient would be critical. Who does that, um, takes that discussion and what exactly needs to be discussed? Sure. So it happens on a couple of levels. And I think that Bron and her team in the clinic are really important for awareness. As in, this is a hospital where there's research happening. And while you're here, you might have someone come and talk to you about participating in that research. Then we have a dedicated pathology research officer, my great offsider, Kelton, the quiet man in the black t-shirt. He's the man who goes and talks to these patients once the topic has been breached by someone like Ron about, okay, we'd like you to participate. This is what we could do. This is what you could do. The important word there is participate. It's very much voluntary. And for biobanking, it's entirely altruistic. Patients who donate to the biobank get absolutely nothing out of it. Absolutely nothing. There's no spin, no, no I, I, I cannot spin it any, <laughs> any other way. A biscuit maybe? Yeah, not, not, no, even that. Not, not, even, not even a biscuit. And in fact, they don't even get to find out how their samples get used. So you don't even know which research projects you may have contributed to. Because once that research specimen comes to me, it's entirely de-identified. You'll never know where that tissue went and the people who receive that tissue will never know who it comes from. So it's an entirely altruistic decision, but it's a decision that patients have to make for themselves. And they can say no, and if they say no, and sometimes they do, that's fine and you get exactly the same treatment as you would otherwise. There is no formal biobank legislation in Australia. However, human tissue legislation and laws relating to contract, medical negligence, trespass to the body and breach of confidence are highly relevant. The National Health and Medical Research Council has also developed a national statement on ethical conduct in human research, which contains guidelines on databanks, human tissue samples and human genetics for researchers and human ethics committees in Australia. MARTA's uh, Gynecological and Breast Cancer Biobank has been running for 10 years. It's, it's an extraordinary amount of time. It's a long time. Um, what has it contributed to over those years? Now, it sounds like a long time, but in fact it's not. But, um, and it really started off pretty much on, on like, you know, the sniff of an oily rag in terms of resourcing. So we always started small and have built up. So where what have we contributed to? So... At the moment, we supply specimens to about 11 different research teams across Brisbane. When you think about how do you work out the contribution that something like a biobank has made, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. So how many research teams are we helping? The specimens we use are really important to their research. How many papers have they, have they published? So they now have results out there about ovarian and breast cancer in the public sphere. That's in the hundreds. The specimens they use are really valuable and it helps those groups get research grants to further their research. So how much have we helped with there? About $12 million in research grants. However, I think probably the best example I can think of and one that also tells you a little bit about the time spans of biobanks is that Prof John Hooper from Mata Research who was an initial partner in the biobank. He helped set it up. He's been following his pet protein. Every researcher has their favourite protein. So he has his favourite protein, which he knew was expressed in ovarian cancer. The biobank specimens have been integral to his research. And over the 10 years, that's gone from us saying, here is some tumour, John, take it away to your lab, do what you can with it, to a clinical trial that's now running at RBWH over 10 years. And that's an amazing achievement. It really is. And we will be talking to, uh, to John on Smarter in the coming weeks about his clinical trial. But what other research projects are you specifically involved in? Sure. So we're sort of like the infrastructure or the backbone of research projects. So we supply a lot of different research projects and we get involved at different levels. Sometimes it'll just be tissues. Sometimes we offer them pathology expertise. But around town, there's a whole range of different projects we contribute to. Some of those are about immune responses to cancer. Some of those are about earlier detection, earlier detection of recurrence. So there's a whole range of different programs going on at the moment. Rowan, it sounds really collaborative and not a competitive type environment. Is that the case? Oh, definitely. And I think that when we set up the biobank all those years ago, one of the foundation statements was that we were going to be outward looking and we wanted to collaborate with as many people as possible. So the researchers we collaborate with come from all over Brisbane, not just MARTA, 
And we've always had the idea that, no, the door is open to anyone to come with us with a reasonable idea, any accredited researcher who will have a project that's ethically approved and so on, and if they've got the funding to carry on their research and do it properly, we're always very happy to help them. Are they the key factors in how you decide which research to support? Yes. So firstly, every every significant piece of research has to be ethically cleared by a human research and ethics committee, either here at MARTA or at a similar institution. But a lot of the time it is researchers coming to us and we like it when they come to us early and we can tell them what can we do for you. A lot of researchers don't necessarily have that hospital exposure so they won't be aware of exactly what we can offer them in terms of different specimens, specimen types, other things we can do for them or conversely sometimes they'll ask for something and we'll just go, that's just not going to fly. Have you thought about doing this instead? You spoke earlier, Rowan, about Marta's pathology research officer and, and his role in, in communications and, and consent. Uh, from those interactions, do you think there's um, enough education around biobanks and the role that they actually play in the future of healthcare? Biobanks are a really hard sell. They're, they're profoundly unsexy. I think also that most research funding tends to go on sort of a three to year, five year cycle, as in people are funded for a project, whereas a biobank is a long term commitment. So that's why earlier we talked about 10 years of biobanking, not actually that long. When we make a commitment to a patient, when they give us permission to use their tissue in research to bank it, you know, it's a big commitment for us because we're saying that we're going to take custody of that tissue and look after it. And that's a long term. We're talking 10, 20, 30, 40 year commitment. And biobanking is really hard to fund on an ongoing basis to get that funding every year to sustain it. So it really, you have to look upon it as being infrastructure. It's like plumbing. You pay to set up plumbing and you pay to maintain plumbing and you enjoy the benefits of plumbing. So we're like the plumbing of the research world. So it's, that's the best example I could give. So. So promoting and raising awareness sounds like a really important piece of um, continuing the biobank's work. What would be some of the messages that you'd want clinicians to know about biobanks? Firstly, just to know that we exist and that patients, something that patients might ask you about. Um, because we usually consent patients in the setting of, you know, you've been admitted to hospital or you're in outpatients, you've probably just had some, you'll be very stressed, you'll have some bad news. So it's often a really difficult time to talk to someone about something as esoteric as biobanking. So what we find is that often it's nursing staff on the wards or probably yourself, Bron, or even GPs who will get asked about what does this mean? When we consent someone, they'll always have something to take away with them. And so we find that sometimes, you know, GPs will be the person who gets asked about what does this mean? So it's really just to know that firstly, biobanking exists and it's very tightly regulated with all the necessary approvals. Secondly, that patients are in charge. And one of the reasons we give patients that piece of paper to take away with contact details is so that if they want to, they can phone up and say, oh, I've, I've had second thoughts, no, no thanks. And that's fine. You know, we have processes for dealing with that. I think the other thing that, you know, in a broader community sense, I think when you say the word hospital, people's associations are around illness or about getting well or about hospitals and operations and nurses. Research doesn't really sort of feature in most people's lists in their, or if it does, it's right down the bottom. So I think in the general community, there's a lack of awareness about just how much research occurs in hospitals and how the patients are really important participants in that research. And so in the gynae oncology unit here, when patients come in, they might talk to any number of researchers about clinical trials, about biobanking, about other research projects. And I think sometimes patients are probably taken by surprise. And it's important to know that that's entirely normal. And in fact, it's something to be aimed for. Because that's where good research starts. Good research starts at the bedside with a clinical question. It starts with why did this patient do well and this patient didn't do well? Then it might go off to the laboratory where you've got the stereotype of the, the re researcher in a white, white coat, coat with a oh. coloured <laughs> chest tube holding it up to the light. It's and real, it, is it, Rowan? <laughs> entirely no. stage managed. But then it comes back to the bedside and that's where the benefit is. And for our patients, you know, when we're talking about biobanking, the benefit isn't to them. It's to the patients five, ten years down the line. And, you know, if I wanted to give patients one little nugget to think about, it's the other patients 10 years ago who were in your position, 
That's why you're getting the best possible treatment today because of the choices they made. Biobank Graz in Austria is regarded as the largest biobank in the world with approximately 20 million individual specimens of body fluids and human tissue stored at the facility for scientific research purposes. Meanwhile, Australia's largest biobank is the New South Wales Health Statewide Biobank, which opened in 2017. It's the largest facility of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere, with large-scale robotic technology storing and processing over 3 million human biospecimens. Rowan, how do you see the live tissue biobanking at MARTA evolving and continuing into the future? Well, firstly, we'd like to do more of it. At the moment, you know, we do... Well, we do the low-hanging fruit, if you like, and we do what's in demand. We'd really like to build, if you like, a better library of living tissue that's frozen down, which we can then bring back and give to researchers at a later date. So at the moment, we're very opportunistic. We know what researchers are looking for. So a lot of our tissue goes out fresh immediately. But what we'd really like is, a, if you like, a frozen library that we can go to when a researcher says, would you have five examples of this unusual tumour? And we can say... Yeah, in fact, we've got we've got some in the freezer. You can grow that in your, in your laboratory. We've got some frozen down as well if you just want to extract some RNA and some DNA. I also have my giant pathology archive, so we can pull preserved tissue out of that if you want to look at your biomarkers. And by the way, we've got blood from these patients as well, so if you're interested in your protein in their blood as well, we can match all that up for you. That That would be the dream. Rowan, you mentioned the process of freezing live samples and then bringing them back to life. What does that involve? What does that look like? Well, we're getting there. So, and it's, it's actually common practice in research laboratories. Once you have a cell line that's going, doing it from fresh tissue is a little bit more difficult. But really, it's just about choosing the right medium that buffers cells as they get frozen, freezing them in a particular way so they don't get frozen too quickly, and then maintaining them at a really cold temperature in, in liquid nitrogen usually until you want to pull them back again and bring them back to life. So it is like a, a form of suspended animation. Bang, does it look like a giant cold room? Is that... <laughs> it's, it's just a very big freezer. Just, just, just imagine you owned a lot of ice cream. <laughs> that would be about it. Just trying um, to, to get a picture of, of all that amazing work that you've that been doing. Um, before we wrap up... Um, we want to know about the, the live tissues samples that you have taken to date and what's actually happened to them. Sure. So some of those have gone across to different groups, say, at TRI, at Marta Research, at the Translational Research Institute. So they've been used to – so there's a couple of different projects over there that are looking at um, – sensitivity to different chemotherapy agents and in particular there's a couple of projects looking at if we combine different agents are they more effective and less toxic there's also projects which have been looking at the expression of different proteins um, within tumors and also looking at the way that um, they respond to immune cells as well that, that, that's what's going on at the moment but that's all other people's work so i can't really speak to it that much so out of curiosity, are there any uh, samples that are more popular or in demand than others? Sure. So in research, mm -hmm. demand for specimens is driven by the funding that's available and the funding that's available is driven pretty much by national priorities. Mm -hmm. So obviously breast cancer funding is very competitive at the moment because it's a really important issue. So breast cancers in particular are in demand by different research groups. In the ovarian space, again, there's been a lot of funding now going towards the major forms of ovarian cancer. So again, they're often the groups we work with. So if you like the, and popular is a terrible word, but they're the in-demand specimens because they're responding to the funding that's available. MARTA being such a big institution with so many patients, we also see a lot of the rarer cancers as well. And it's really unfortunate because it's really hard to get funding to research a rare cancer. But part of being a biobank is that we'd like to get into the process of banking those specimens so that over years we'll accumulate them. So one day in the future when someone manages to get funding for some of the rarer cancers, we'll be there waiting with a stock of biological specimens for them. So, Rowan, before we go, we'd like to introduce you to a little segment we call The Checkup. Oh, I've been dreading this. <laughs> so you, you've heard of the checkup, and obviously it's about getting to know a little bit about you. So uh, Bronwyn's going to ask five quick questions. Are you okay. ready? Thank you. Brace yourself. So the first question, if you had a day off today, what would you do? 
Um, I moved house a couple of weeks ago, so it would involve removing things from cardboard boxes and breaking down cardboard boxes. If you could impart one piece of knowledge on a medical student, what would it be? Uh, I impart so many pieces of knowledge on the medical students. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of which would be the most important. Maybe not medical students, but my pathology trainings. One of the things I try to teach them is efficiency because I think we think a lot about um, sort of book knowledge and we think a lot about learning skills and it's often medical students and trainee doctors don't necessarily also realise that you have to be able to do it efficiently. Mm. So I, that's, that's what I try to teach. Mm. What TV show best portrays your profession? I can't think of any TV shows that actually um, portray anatomical pathologists that's non-forensic anatomical pathologists. I think all the ones I can think of is forensic. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all forensics. Yep. And yeah, so we, we sort of miss out. I, I think um, for medicine in general, uh, I'll go quite obscure. There was a British series called Cardiac Arrest in the 90s when I was a junior doctor. And it was about the life of junior doctors in the NHS. and. It, it, it had been written by a junior doctor. You could just tell about the sheer hell of working as a junior doctor. <laughs> if you weren't doing your job, what would you be doing instead? Well, my, my second choice in medicine was anaesthetics. So I would be doing anaesthetics. I really enjoyed anaesthetics, but you did have to get up very early in the morning. So that sort of killed it for me. <laughs> and the final question, if you had to invite three guests to dinner, who would you invite? Firstly, um, Winston Churchill. I have a interest in 20th century history and he made a lot of it and lived through a lot of it, right through from the apex of the British Empire to its decline. So a late Winston Churchill, who would be reflective, would be fascinating. I would love to have Germaine Greer. Ooh, Ooh feisty. Yes, I, I, I can imagine the dialogue between the two. But And I don't always agree with Germaine Greer, but she's a fascinating conversationalist and always will argue her point. I think with those two, at pol perhaps polar ends, I think maybe a, a peacemaker would be useful. And to cover sort of 21st century history, that would be Barack Obama. Mm. And I think he's someone who could probably bring those two people together so you could have a fruitful discussion rather than shouting at one another from either end of the table. And I love the way that you've really thought about that. <laughs> that and it sounds like a fantastic night. And it's um, also great to get to know you as well, Ron. Thanks for joining us on Smarter. Thank you. It's great to be here. For our listeners at home or in the car or having a well-deserved break between patients, thank you for tuning in. See you next time on Smarter. <laughs>